Hey everybody, how's it going? Hey, hey. Happy Sunday. So we are at the dawn of a new wave of computing, one that will require you to wear your technology on your body and even your face with uh, smart glasses and head-mounted displays. And that's going to allow you to look through and even enter a digital world. And of course, I'm talking about augmented reality or AR and virtual reality or VR. And there's nobody better to sit down to talk about this subject with than Tony Parisi from Unity Technology. So thanks for sitting down with me. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's great to be here. Uh, can you hear me out there, folks? Here we go. I'll speak up a little bit. Um, yeah, so where do we start? We're going to start, well, I wanted to do a little bit of a poll with you guys to see where you're all at with these technologies. So before you came to this World's Fair Nano, raise your hand if you ever experienced virtual reality before. Okay. Whoa, right. you guys are woke people. <laughs> it's about three quarters of the room here. And how about augmented reality? Before you came here, you experienced augmented reality. Okay, a little bit less. Okay, just, just for fun though, since we're in San Francisco, how many of you think that this reality is a simulation? Okay, well that's only a third. I was expecting more from you, San Francisco. <laughs> we'll get you there. So Tony, maybe just to help the folks that aren't familiar with AR, VR, MR, XR, you know, what are all these technologies? All right, so uh, let's start with virtual reality, and I guess most of you are, are familiar with that at this point. That is, you put a headset on your face, you may have additional things you're holding, like input controllers that are like game controllers, and you move around in a virtual environment that's rendered in 3D and presented to you, and you're completely immersed and encased in it. Whereas augmented reality or mixed reality, and these definitions are a little bit fuzzy right now, tend to overlay graphics, you know, 3D virtual stuff onto a world that you can still see, either wearing uh, uh, some kind of headset like the Microsoft HoloLens or a pair of smart glasses eventually in the future, or augmented reality could be what you can do through your phone today playing a game like Pokemon Go where you see the real world behind you but there's uh, Pokemon characters overlaid on that and that technology is getting much, much more sophisticated now now that Apple and Google have announced uh, AR Kit, AR Core, which is tech that gives you full 3D graphics in your environment that you can see through your smartphone. And you've been working in VR for a long, long time. You've been a pioneer, 3D environments, uh, web VR back in the 90s. So tell us a little bit about how you got started back then. Uh, yeah, so um, wife and I moved out here in the mid-90s. Uh, I, was, I was planning on pursuing my, uh, my dream of getting rich on the internet, like a lot of people were doing back <laughs> in the mid-90s, and it was the internet was starting to ramp up. And I met this fellow named Mark Pesci, who uh, showed me real-time 3D graphics on a personal computer back then, which was a pretty stunning feat. Not a fancy, uh, expensive workstation, but an affordable home computer. And he said, I want to connect this to the internet. And I said, do you mean like uh, Snow Crash, which was this book I read, which I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with that, and I'm definitely dating myself, but it's a science fiction novel that's uh, sort of like Ready Player One, which a lot more people may be familiar with, uh, about the metaverse, about a virtual world that we're all in, hooked in together, and it's experiencing digital reality and in some consensus way. And so we decided to put together 3D graphics with the fledgling World Wide Web over 20 years ago when either of these technologies worked. Um, it was a great technical experiment. It was clearly not ready for the market. I mean, this was back when you needed a fancy graphics card you would plug into a PC, mm -hmm. and now your phone is a thousand times more powerful than that configuration. It was dial-up modems, if you know what those are, those things that squeak and squawk that used to connect to a, a landline uh, with your telephone. And this is back before people even knew how to make a 2D website, let alone produce 3D graphics. So needless to say, it was real early, but um, I've been captivated by that kind of vision since then, and I've worked on projects related to that over the last 20 years. And you took a hiatus for a while in virtual reality, came back around 2012, I think it was. So what, what brought you back to this space? So I stayed in 3D graphics the whole time, either doing gaming or visualization for enterprise, you know, um, presenting CAD models on a 2D screen, you know, just working on 3D applications, that I, you know, stuff I was passionate about. I, I love 3D. I think it's the, you know, the interface of the future. But the reality was you could only sort of present this on flat screens until the Oculus Rift came along. 
Uh, that company, Oculus, launched a really successful Kickstarter, raised a few million dollars, the biggest Kickstarter to date at that mm -hmm. point, mm -hmm. and kind of hit the scene. And I started tinkering with the Oculus Rift. I tried that first one. They called it the DK1, the Developer Kit 1. I put it on my head, and I lasted about 10 minutes in it, and I took it off, and I said, this isn't ready yet. But Oculus kept sort of plugging away at it for the next couple of years. They put a second edition out that was much better, and then this historic event happened, which is Facebook bought them for billions of dollars. Uh, with the idea that they were going to mainstream this technology. And, and once that happened, now we're talking about 2014, it was sort of game on uh, in Silicon Valley in San Francisco startup land where everyone wanted, to, everyone wanted to get in on this. They looked at this as the new technology of the future. And a lot of startups here got funded. A lot of the big companies started making their own VR har hardware, not just uh, Facebook. So that, that really sort of pulled me back into it again. I, I was pretty reluctant about it at first because I, I felt like the tech wasn't quite ready. But mm -hmm. I, like so many other people, got really swept up by the excitement and, and, and the groundswell of people that wanted to go attack this problem. And, and when I saw the industry kind of getting together that way and that uh, collaborating that much and throwing that much resource into it, I, I started getting this comfort level that maybe this time it was actually going to you know, work because the technology was small enough, cheap enough, comfortable enough, we're not quite there yet with VR, um, and accessible enough to everybody that this could end up being a global phenomenon and actually be a way that we experience entertainment content and, and build enterprise applications for training and all these wonderful other things you can do with VR. Well, and that's a good segue into talking about how augmented reality and virtual reality are changing work. So in what ways are you seeing the enterprise use these technologies? Well, I'll start with training. That's a, a somewhat obvious one if you're familiar with VR, the idea that you can put someone into a virtual reality rig and train them to do a procedure, like assemble a piece of equipment, operate a piece of machinery. The idea being that companies will pay for that. They'll, they'll pay for a pretty expensive PC, you know, a, a high-end one that really renders the graphics fast. They'll pay for that Oculus Rift. That's just a few grand total cost of ownership to make somebody productive or uh, improve safety in the job. So that's a drop in a bucket, that cost, right? And even developing the training software uh, itself, you know, that may be uh, labor intensive and a bit expensive, but it's still, if you can provide that kind of application to increase productivity and, and improve safety, uh, companies will pay for that all day long. And we're starting to see that in, um, in automotive manufacturing, in the energy sector, and in other places. Right. Well, it's about this idea of, in one hand, using augmented reality to turn an, an amateur worker into a professional overnight by giving them access to information right in their line of sight, right? Well, yeah. I mean, let's talk about AR. This is like, that's, that's even better for this stuff. So that's less about the simulation and training. That could be about maintenance and repair. It could be about learning how to operate a piece of equipment as well. And right now, what you have to do is you've got the equipment in front of you without AR, and you have to then look down at the manual, right? If you could have that information presented, as you were saying, in your line of sight, and it tells you what that doohickey is, that's a technical term, by the way, if it tells you what that doohickey is that you're looking at, hmm. um, then you can be that much more effective, and you have the, the, the physical experience of working on that at the same time you're getting that information. Right, right, right. So you're saving that time from looking at the manual back to whatever you're doing. You know, one of the best examples I saw of that was uh, a sub shop was actually using it. I know it sounds... Uh, uh, funny, but they were using a pair of Google Glass to actually uh, provide the step-by-step -step instructions on how to make the perfect sub, uh, which, you know, it, it actually reduced the time uh, to actually create the sub because you weren't going back to the manual or the stickers that were, you know, there in front of you. So there it is. it's kind of a simple example. Uh, but, you know, work isn't just the only place that this technology is being used. And right now we have anybody from Snapchat to Google uh, Apple, some new incumbents like Meta and Micro, uh, Magic Leap, which are startups, and even most recently we heard Bose uh, trying to get into this new race to get glasses on our face that we will wear on a regular basis to augment our life. So why, why should a, a consumer care about this? Like, what is the promise of wearing glasses that are digitally connected? Well, uh, clearly in the world we live in, consumers are digitally connected continuously, right? And uh, we look at our phone, what are the stats now? Thousands of times a day now? It was hundreds last time that I looked, I just heard a new study about this. I think it's two to three thousand times a day we look at our phones and the idea that we can maybe get our heads up and not be looking at the phone all the time to access some of that information is pretty enticing, whether it's information about social communication, you know, the stuff you're seeing on your feed, uh, or whether it's you know the news, or whether it's entertainment you're interested in, the idea that you wouldn't have to be searching through this device or holding this device up in front of you, which is actually 
ergonomically not that great, my shoulder's already tired just doing this, right? If that could be something you could look through instead and call that up with facility, then we could be even more connected, we'd have even more uh, frictionless access to stuff that we care about mm. in the day. That could be products we're looking for if we're shopping and we're out and about in the real world, you know, not, you know, cooped up online. Or it, it could be something where it's like, hey, what is that thing I am looking at? Right. And now you can just pull up a Wikipedia entry triggered immediately by the object you were looking right, at. Right. Like, like so, the person that you met last week that you still can't remember their name and it's so awkward. Okay, so I work at this place, <laughs> Unity, and we are growing so fast. We have about 2,000 people almost. We're going to hit that this year worldwide. In our San Francisco office at 3rd and Market, we're going to hit about 400. And I meet a lot of people, and I know them, and I can't remember their damn names. I wish I had the HR application that just like pulled that up right in front of me in my glasses yeah, right now. I hear you. Because I just see them on a daily basis. Right? I'm Tom, by the way. I, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm not that bad. I'm not having a senior <laughs> moment right now. <laughs> so how many of you in the audience would buy a pair of glasses that allow you to see technology through your line of sight instead of having to look down at your phone? Okay, wow, you guys are a well-connected bunch. You're our target audience for sure. <laughs> Come meet me after, I'll get your email address. I know a couple of companies I want to sell to you. Uh, so are we there yet though? Like, are we gonna see glasses be on the shelf tomorrow? So I'm not a hardware expert, but I do talk to a lot of people in hardware. Uh, my company Unity partners with all the people making the VR and AR hardware. Um, so if I talk to folks from Google, you know, like Clay Bavor, the VP of you know, VR and AR over there, uh, or other folks at Microsoft. Everyone has their different, or the folks at Oculus who are working hard on all this stuff. The, everyone has their different timeline in, in their head about this. And I think, you know, some people are thinking about it purely as technologists and saying, well, until we can get something that's like just your sunglasses and have the whole computer contained right here, we're not going to have true AR in glasses. And that, in terms of electronics manufacturing, is still years out. But you know, other people say, well, you, just some lightweight, comfortable AR glasses maybe connected with a cord or connected with faster networking to something in your hip pocket, which is maybe the phone form factor. Maybe that could be working in, in the next two or three years. So it kind of depends on who you talk to. And then you know, when you get really specific, like a meta or Magic Leap, they all have their roadmaps when they think they can make that stuff right. smaller and better and lighter. But that's all kind of within their own sphere and how they're looking at the world as well. But I'd have to say that. I think we're feeling like collectively in the next five years, someone's going to have some breakthrough where it really is the big AR glasses that we could just be wearing continually during the day. You know? And, you know, as global head of AR and VR at Unity, you see a lot of content for these platforms. What are one or two examples that have really stuck with you that, you know, inspire you uh, as you continue to work in the space? Well, I, I kind of have a short memory for these things, so I'm just going to go back to what I saw at Sundance recently, which was just absolutely awesome. So Sundance Film Festival, for the last few years, has had something called New Frontier, which was their way of doing digital technology. They would prepare, premiere new digital tech like mobile or whatever was really cool that was entertainment focused for storytellers. So either you know, films delivered via new technology like streaming or what have you. And for the last three or four years now, I think, New Frontier has featured VR content. Mm. It started out with 360 videos in your Gear VR or even cardboard, and now it's full Oculus Rift, HTC Vive, really deep VR experiences they're showing. And uh, this wonderful piece made with Unity, of course, as most things are in VR these days, um, it's called Spheres. It's made by a woman named Eliza McNitt who's really into science. She's a, a director who does uh, science programming. And Spheres is the story of the collision of two black holes. <laughs> and you're inside the Oculus Rift and you're basically floating up through black holes. And it is just visually incredible. Jessica Chastain's beautiful voice is narrating this whole experience. And it was just this amazing tour de force of, you know, basically like a, a Nova or a Cosmos science program that you are in the middle of. It's narrative, but, you, you know, so it's linear, but you can move around it. And that is just so fabulous. Mm. And, and that, is, that was so well received, in fact, that something historic happened at Sundance, which, which was Spheres was picked up for a distribution deal right. for over a million dollars, like a movie-style indie movie distribution deal. Um, and there was one other piece called Zeker, which was more of a documentary piece about Sufis dancing, actually. Also made in Unity, but it had a lot of 360 video as well. Uh, also picked up for a distribution deal like that. So these stories that are being told in VR to me are just so incredible. And I think we're going to start seeing that storytelling 
come into these small form factor AR phones as well, where it may be just a character, mm. or maybe you pick your phone up and it starts with that character, but then the phone becomes a magic window where you see a full virtual world. It's a portal into that world without having to put the headset on. Right. So, so for me, I, I, I really key in on storytelling right, right, right. And, and all the aspects of that, whether it's for entertainment or for education purposes or even for advertising, which I'm particularly interested in and passionate about. Well, and that's what's really powerful about augmented reality and virtual reality is that we're giving us the power to create and not just create content, but create new worlds that we could potentially be living in. So, you know, what are, what are our responsibilities as an industry to help ensure that this world or these worlds that we're creating are positive and inclusive and diverse? How, how do we go about that? I, I think the events of the last couple of years globally, geopolitically, uh, are framing what's in front of us in terms of the responsibilities our industry has. When you think about how social media is this technology that it has now proven to be able to disrupt the social order, the political order, the way we even relate to each other, and the way whether or not we're being civil to each other. Now imagine taking super immersive storytelling technology that can bring you to other worlds, can potentially train you, can potentially heal sickness, and you know, create empathy and all these wonderful things. We don't want these technologies to be used for bad purposes. Uh, you can imagine some people will. So I think it's on us as an industry to be mindful of that and, and somewhat vigilant. And uh, I wanted to talk about my question that I had to the audience before we leave the stage. You know, you were quoted in VentureBeat to talk a little bit about how these technologies may actually cause us to see this world as an illusion. Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? As we go deeper down the road of augmenting our reality, entering simulations, will we come back and look at this world differently? We absolutely will come back and look at this world differently. Um, you know, the real world and the media that we create and, and communicate to each other, there's always an interplay with those. And that media and the stories we tell in there that, you know, they're, they're taking our imaginations and our hopes and dreams and codifying them, they, they have a big influence on how the real world works. We take those stories out of VR. We take them out of a book we read and we maybe make change based on those. They can be super inspiring. So there really is that interplay. Uh, by the way, for the record, I don't think we're living in a simulation. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not one of those people. And I, th I think that sort of thinking goes back as, as far back as Descartes. Descartes was saying we lived in a machine. You know, that was what we would take mm -hmm. things that are technologies we created and start modeling them and saying, well, the real world's really that. The world is a clock, right? Yeah. Or during the Industrial Revolution, the world is a, a big complicated piece of machinery. Or more recently, the world is a computer. And we model these things this way because we sort of fall in love with our creations and our mental models of those. I think we're seeing the same thing around com computing, simulation, and VR. Um, I think this is the real world. I think it's one of them, and we got to take good care of it, Yeah, <laughs> actually. That's good advice. So last question before we leave the stage, and we're going to be heading over to some Q&A in the breakout area. But one of the great things about VR is that you get to be another person or another thing. What is your go-to? Like, What would be your go-to avatar in these new worlds? Well, for some reason, when I'm an avatar, I always make myself female. Um, I started that uh, when I first really started using Second Life a lot, if you know what Second Life was. Uh, that's, it's still around, um, and that company's doing really well, actually, and is resurgent with VR. But mm. they've been around for over a decade now, and it's a virtual world with millions of people in it. And for some reason, I, I guess I always wanted to be a, a woman in VR. That's awesome. I'm a unicorn, by the way. You can come see me later. Go Big unicorn. round of applause for Tony, everybody. And for Tom. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll be back there in the breakout room for a Q&A. See you there.